Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. As part of our ongoing coverage of the U.S. elections, we're going to be focusing on various races for Senate and for the House and for mayor and perhaps even city council. One of the races that we're particularly interested in is for the Senate race in Maryland because we're in Baltimore and in case you don't know, that's in Maryland. And we're very interested in this race because this is more or less a Democratic Party state. Uh, there's some, of course, a Republican governor, but generally speaking, this party votes for the Democratic Party, which means that in this state, and I guess in others similarly, it's known as the machine. And people running against the machine, we find interesting. So today we're going to speak to one of these people, meaning the Green Party candidate for Senate in Maryland. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Paul. So Margaret Flowers. Yep. Dr. Margaret Flowers is running for Barbara Mikulski's Senate seat. She's on the Green Party ticket. She's a pediatrician in the Baltimore area, co-chair of the Maryland Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program, and also co-director of popularresistance.org and It's Our Economy. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So first of all, tell, tell me about the Democratic Party uh, nominee, who's Chris Van Hollen. Right. Uh, the machine has backed him against Donna Edwards. He won the primary. And usually in Maryland for Senate, if you win the primary, you win the election. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about his program you disagree with? What are two key, couple of key points? And what would you do differently? Well, first, just to put it in context, Chris Van Hollen, who's been a member of Congress for quite a long time and was a former head of the DCCC, which is the Democratic uh, Congressional Campaign Committee that you know helps to elect the the Democrats, the House Democrats. His job as head of the DCCC was really to funnel the money from Wall Street to the various Democratic candidates. And so what was interesting in the primary race is that he raised over $8.3 million, which is really unheard of for a Senate race in the state of Maryland. And his primary funder is actually a PAC that, that primarily funds Republican candidates. And then the rest of them, many of them were uh, financial institutions, K Street lobbyists, real estate developers. And he had so, very strong support from APAC, which is the sort of right, neocon pro right. Right, right. Uh, lobbying arm of the Israeli government. Uh, so he has this kind of progressive air, but he is very much a Wall Street establishment uh, candidate. And, you know, with the, the crises that we're facing right now, we need to, you know, we don't need another kind of a Hillary Clinton in, in the Senate. We need to move towards uh, candidates that are actually going to fight for the solutions that we need. So if we look at kind of two areas where Chris and I are, are very different, one would be health care. Chris Van Hollen is a big supporter of the Affordable Care Act. He, he says that quite openly. And I have been a, a longtime supporter of a national improved Medicare for all type of system. Now, the support, we had very strong support for that going into the health reform process in 2008, 2009, 2010. And then when the Affordable Care Act passed, that support kind of dropped off as people thought, well, let's give this, this bill a chance and see if it works. Now here we are six years later, people are seeing that health care costs continue to rise. People still can't afford to get the care they need. Tens of millions are uninsured. The polls have flipped back around to where they were before. Over 80% of Democratic voters want a single-payer health care system. But Chris Van Hollen is not and never has been a supporter of a single-payer health care system. The Affordable Care Act is a much more market-based type of health care system. And then the same kind of thing when it comes to the climate crisis. He has this reputation of being, you know, such a progressive environmentalist and putting forth strong legislation that would tax and create a tax and dividend system on, you know, carbon, the use of carbon. And the problem with this approach is that it really is kind of a market-based approach to dealing with the climate crisis, that we're going to, you know, tax the fossil fuel industry and give those taxes back to people then try to who can build up renewable energy. Now, is he more for a carbon tax or is he for cap and trade? Not cap and trade. It's it's a carbon tax and dividend type of cap, uh, Carbon cap tax is somewhat more rigorous definitely. than cap and trade. Right. It is more rigorous, but it's still leaving the problem up to the market, forces us to solve. And we just don't have the time to have that kind of a, an approach. There, that's not going to be a comprehensive approach to the climate crisis. And right now, with the situation escalating the way it is, we really need a comprehensive, all-out push for 100% renewable energy as quickly as we can. So what does that look like? If you're if you are the senator, what does your bill look like? Well, um, it, it focuses on a number of things. I mean, one is our Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the body that regulates uh, interstate 
energy basically as a rubber stamp for the fossil fuel industry. And they don't consider the health impacts of the projects that they approve. They don't uh, consider the long-term impacts on the climate of the projects they approve. We need to fundamentally change that institution. It's actually funded completely through the permits that it gives to the fossil fuel industry. It doesn't actually take any taxpayer dollars at all. So they said, we're, we're not in the habit of denying a permit. That has to stop. So we need to, to alter that mission to be a no. We're going to go all out pushing for 100% renewable energy and stopping the fossil fuel projects that they've permitted. And I think even going back in retrospect and looking at so some of the ones. So how detailed does this, have you worked this out? Like there needs to be some kind of transition. So how, what does that look like? So I would, I would stop any more, any more investment in fossil fuel infrastructure. Because basically when you're doing that, you're locking us into 30 or 40 more years of using fossil fuels. And instead. You're talking about public investment. Right. How would well, you... permitting, permitting them. That's, you know, allowing them to be, whether these are private corporations that are appealing to the FERC to get their projects permitted. We need to stop permitting that fossil fuel infrastructure and instead do much more of a, of a concerted push for renewable energy, which we can do. It, it's, we can scale that up much more rapidly um, than we can, you know, well, just it's very easy to, and quickly to quickly scale that up. Why do you think... Uh, it's interesting because we were just talking about this editorially. Uh, even in the Democratic primary, the climate change was a second, third, sometimes not even a front of, 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 of table issue. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is, that it's given the urgency, given all the science, it, it's still not in the public discourse of, uh, in, in a serious way? Well, more people are getting it. I mean, people in the United States have been so subjected to believing that, you know, gas is a, fo is a bridge fuel and that, you know, that, and kind of there was so much science trying to persuade people to not believe in the climate crisis. But I think that's changing. I mean, we're no, starting to see a majority of people in the U.S. that actually I are getting it. the majority that. of people now do say it's, it's a human-caused event, but right. it's, given that, it's still in the political discourse. It's not that big an issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're also, the fossil fuel industry is major funders of political campaigns, so... Uh, which actually we had an interesting action where we went to the DNC, the Democratic National uh, Convention Committee office in D.C. a year or so ago and, and called out the fact that so many of the Democrats like Clinton, like Andrew Cuomo, like Martin Almali and others were in the hands of the you know, pockets of the fossil fuel industry. So continue, what, what else is in your bill? So first of all, it's a, uh, over what kind of time frame do you make this move to 100% so sustainable? So the, the, the goal would be to shoot for 100% renewable by 2030. Now that's, that's going to be a, a big, we could probably get 80% of there, away there by 2030, but who knows over the next, you know, 10 or so years how the, how the research is going to change. Things are accelerating so quickly and there could be some breakthroughs in storage, which are, you know, that's a particular area, as well as I think airline travel is another area that we don't have the technology yet to deal with that, moving off fossil fuels. But, um, but it, I would say aim for by 2030. And uh, much of this, you would think, has to be accomplished through regulation in terms of coal, coal uh, carbon emissions and such. I wish regulation worked. <laughs> I wish regulation worked. I think it's going to have to happen through, uh, through it, through specific public investment and uh, on, on the subsidies. creation side. Right. But you have to ha also have some kind of slowing down and eliminating emissions. Well, coal is already slowing down, which is great. And there's it, it, another piece of this too. If we look at the whole picture of the climate crisis, it's much bigger than just the energy, although that's a very large part of it. And we need to include in that uh, clean, rapid. Tan transit and you know very efficient rapid transit so we can move off of using you know gas and cars for our way to get around at least there are some countries that are actually moving uh, towards all electric cars and that you know we can put in the infrastructure to assist that kind of thing as well as as clean rapid transit but there's also um, promoting carbon sequestration through agricultural practices and wetland restoration that we need to do to help to bring the carbon levels down. You know, we've hit 400 parts per million, and they're pretty much saying that that's going to be where we are from here out. So. Well, what else is sort of, a, in terms of when you're out campaigning, the, the issues you're most talking about? Well, I think the economy is another really huge one, and, and rethinking the way that we structure our economy. And we have very much like we have an extractive energy industry. We also have a very extractive economy that uh, comes into cities and, and places, and we have like large industries or large box stores that come in, and they don't treat the workers well. They take a lot of the money that they that they earn there 
back to their headquarters, wherever that is. And so they're ex really extracting the money out of communities. And when they feel that they can't profit well or they get a better deal somewhere else, they just move there. So we really have to change to economies that are rooted in communities, that are, that are going to stay there, recirculate the dollars there, create good jobs, more worker control over uh, those economies so that they can make sure that they're getting a living wage, that they have decent working conditions and benefits. Um, so support for more of those types of endeavors as well as things like public banks that really protect our public dollars from Wall Street banks. Have you done any campaigning in some of the areas, uh, you know, Dundalk or uh, some of the other places where you have sections of the working class uh, that might be sort of supporting Trump and kind of buy into some of that kind of politics? I've and certainly, so you know, through our kind of, you know, it's just interesting. A lot of what I'm doing because it's a statewide campaign and I just don't have the resources to be everywhere at once. So the most efficient way for me to reach people is to either call them on the telephone or go where they are. So that's really how I've been focusing. And so I've been calling people all over Maryland. And, um, and sometimes, you know, I'll call a home and maybe it was a younger person in the home that was registered as a green and I end up getting a parent instead. And so I talk to them. And... I would say that most of the time when we start talking and they say, well, what do you think about this issue or what do you think about that, that we actually, they say, well, I, I think I might vote for you. And the same thing down in Southern Maryland in Calvert County where I've been working to fight Dominion's, uh, the gas refinery and export terminal that they're building in Southern Maryland. The first one being put in a residential community is very unsafe for that community. And that's a Republican stronghold down there. And people are just sick of the politics as usual. They're sick of the corruption. They're sick of not being listened to. Did you see the, in, the recent poll that showed that I think 90% of people in the United States don't have faith in our political system, that it was like less than 20% in both the Democrats and Republicans that think their party even listens to the needs of the voters. I mean, people are really fed up with the establishment. Okay, well, this is just the beginning of a conversation. Uh, you'll be back and we can talk more about some of the other issues. So I hope so. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.